Welcome to the 2022 State of the River Report for the Lower St. Johns River Basin. This is a panel discussion. My name is Dr. Gretchen Billmeyer Fraser from Jacksonville University, and I'll be moderating this event. The River Report is funded by the City of Jacksonville Environmental Protection Board, and the purpose is to inform the, pu the public about the health of the Lower St. Johns River Basin and provide independent assessments of the status and reports of a variety of parameters. This report has been produced for the past 15 years annually, and the authors are listed below on the slide, several of which we have here serving as panelists. So I'd like to start just by introducing the panelists. Uh, to my left is Dr. Charles Klossman from the University of North, North Florida. And we have Dr. Dale Casamata, also from UNF, Dr. Bill Penwell from Jacksonville University, Dr. Jerry Pento from JU as well, and Dr. Brian Zellner from UNF. I'd like to give special thanks to the reviewers and advisors and the different organizations that have helped to review the report. They're listed on this slide. Um, but it should be noted that the River Report is an independent assessment and reviewing this report does not imply agreement with the opinions and the conclusions reached by the report's authors. The topics in the report uh, generally include a highlight section and I'll discuss this year's highlight section in a minute. We also have a background and a guide for the general public and we also have sections focusing on water quality, fisheries, aquatic life and contaminants. The full report, the appendices with the supporting data, and the, the brochure which consolidates the status and trends of these parameters can all be found at sjrreport.com. This website also has a digital archive of references um, that have been used for the past 15 years. And the website is interactive, so it's searchable by the City of Jacksonville, Council, Council District, Planning District, and so forth. Um, there's also maps and data that visualize vulnerabilities along the St. John's River, as well as lesson plans and educational resources for teachers. In this year's report, um, we have a highlight section and it's written by John, Blur, John Burr. Um, so John Burr, Burr has been a retired, he's a retired general, journalist who has directed news coverage and reported in Jacksonville since 1983. So Burr was editor in chief for the Jacksonville uh, Business Journal and a reporter and senior editor for the Florida Times Union. He was also a contributor to WJCT's Media Roundtable for many years. He was awarded numerous journalism awards as a reporter, columnist, and editor, and is, he is a current uh, board member of three different Jacksonville nonprofits, including Groundworks Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Arboretum and Bar Botanical Gardens, and the Jacksonville Garden Club. So this year's highlights section is on climate change impacts on the Lower St. John's River Basin and on the state of Florida in general. Uh, this includes sea level rise, flooding, urban heat, and wildfires. Now, in addition, we also have an exciting feature of a addition of a story map. These are uh, GIS maps that were produced by Dr. Ashley Johnson from Jacksonville University. And these visualize vulnerabilities along the St. Johns River. Um, and they include um, SSOs or sanitary sewage overflows, impaired waters, septic tanks, um, aquifer vulnerability, and, and a variety of other things that can be actually visualized on a map. And a story map was also included by, uh, that was put together by Hunter Nuku, who's a graduate student at JU. The educational resources for teachers were uh, produced by Dr. Zellner, Ouellette, Klossman, Goldberg, Johnson, and Pinto. And these include video clips on algal blooms, manatees, and oral histories of people who live, work, and recreate on the St. John's River. So now I'd like to transition and give um, and give my colleague, Dr. Charles Klossman, the floor to go ahead and uh, discuss the background of the St. John's River. Thank you very much, Dr. Bielmeyer Fraser, um, and thank you all for attending. So um, this section that I'm going to talk a little bit about is called the Guide for the General Public or the General Public Report. 
And um, what this really seeks to do is a couple of different things. One, it summarizes a lot of the, uh, the information that's in the rest of the report. And so it provides a place where you can read about something that's really important. And then if you want to learn a lot more about it, you can then sort of follow that into one of the detailed chapters on tributaries or contaminants or wetlands and so forth. The other thing that it does is it provides practical advice for the general public. And by this, I mean, in, not only in terms of how safe is it to fish and things like that, but the necessity of fishing licenses, boating safety, opportunities for volunteering and things like that. So there's quite a bit of information about those sorts of things and lots of links. So what I'm going to do is just sort of run through it with these things in mind, that it summarizes what the rest of the report says and emphasizes some of the practical advice. So a first question is, what is the state of the river report in very practical terms? And, and Dr. Bielmar Fraser just mentioned that it summarizes the health of the river. And by health of the river, we really mean in terms of the river supporting human well-being, in terms of recreation, um, algal blooms, you know, ex exposure to things like this, but also uh, biodiversity and supporting a healthy environment for the creatures and ecosystems that exist in the lower St. John's River. And from a practical standpoint, in terms of the research we do, that means assessing water quality, aquatic life, contaminants, and fisheries. And so the remaining chapters of the report are really based upon those different topics. So what does the river report say? And once again, this is the 15th river report uh, for 2022. So as in the previous year, one of the important conclusions is that for the most part, uh, the main stem of the river, what we call the main part of the river is reasonably healthy in terms of water quality, making the river suitable for boating, fishing, and other forms of recreation. And this is based on um, the team's extensive research uh, in terms of dissolved oxygen, um, pollutants, contaminants, and so forth. And this is the same conclusion we uh, reached last year. So in other words, it's basically safe for most of the kinds of recreation that people are interested in doing. Um, fishing, of course, has always been quite popular. Um, this is an image of people fishing. This is probably about uh, 70 or 80 years ago from the Florida State Archives. Um, some of the other good news from the St. John's River Report this year is that plenty, there are plenty of the most popular fish that people like to fish for, including red drum, spotted sea trout, mullet. There's some uncertainty about other popular fish like catfish, but some of the fish that are extremely uh, popular for recreational fishermen are quite common and, and doing quite well right now. Also, other good news, some of the vulnerable species that live in the lower St. John's River Basin um, and animals that have been on the endangered species list in past years, wood storks, for example, are thriving. Bald eagles are doing quite well in this region. In the lower St. John's River Basin, manatees seem to be doing pretty well, although um, they face certain threats due to declining submerged aquatic vegetation, uh, likely increase in boat traffic in future years. So that, you know, the conclusion is that while they're doing right now, it's certainly something we need to take a good look at in future years. And as most of you probably know, there have been problems with manatee populations declining in the Indian River Lagoon. So this is sort of a, a warning to keep an eye on this. There are also reasons for concern, and I, I think the rest of our team is probably going to talk about this. And uh, Jerry Pinto talked about some of this uh, this past Friday at the Environmental Symposium. Some of the tributaries are quite badly polluted, um, and what the general public report just lists a provides a list of selected tributaries. This is by no means all of the tributaries in the St. John's River, but these is this is a selection of tributaries that are polluted according to the criteria of the Clean Water Act, and some of the uh, tributaries listed include Pottsburg Creek Marine Segment, Moncrief Creek, Jones Creek, Trout River, and Dunn Creek. And if you were to read the background section of the report and also the tributary section of the report, you'd see a lot more information on these individual tributaries. Um, there's also concern, and this has been a concern for some time, about a loss of wetlands. And this is a result of um, ongoing urban development, agriculture, and other factors. And in fact, urban development, agriculture, 
uh, runoff from roads and so forth are also the factors that cause pollution in some of the tributaries. And of course, wetlands are incredibly important as uh, breeding grounds for all sorts of fish and support for ecosystems and so forth. Another point of concern that's been a concern for some time is increasing salinity in the lower St. John's River Basin. And salinity seems to have increased in some parts of the lower St. John's River, especially the, the more northern parts of the basin um, in the last uh, year. Uh, and this is possibly causing a loss of su submerged aquatic vegetation. It is likely caused by sea level rise and other factors, including um, dredging activities that began in the 19th century and have continued uh, through much of the 20th century. So um, obviously this is another factor that we need to take a, a close look at, and especially its effect on submerged aquatic vegetation, which seems to be too low at the present time. Submerged aquatic vegetation, of course, is incredibly important uh, also as a spawning ground for all sorts of fish and also as um, a source of food for manatees. Um, now, the general public report also provides a, a lot of practical advice. Um, some of this is, is just really basic stuff like, um, you know, the necessity of um, getting a fishing license, life jackets on boats, things like this, this, observe posted warnings and so forth. It also provides practical advice on if you're concerned about how much fish to consume from a particular river or something like that. We have information on that. Um, and then another source of practical advice or another, another kind of practical advice we provide is lots of information and lots of links about volunteer opportunities if you want to get involved with the St. John's River in some way. One way to do this, of course, is to contact your city council person. And so we provide a map of the at-large districts and the individual council districts. Uh, something that's been in the news quite a lot recently. And this is the most updated map we have right now, but we provide the email address, the telephone number, and the geographic location of the different council districts for uh, readers of the general public report. Suggestions for how you can actually physically and practically get involved helping the river, reduce, reuse, recycle, uh, avoid putting things into storm drains and so forth, minimize your use of fertilizer. All of these things are likely to increase nutrients into the St. John's River and uh, feed algal bloom, something that uh, Dr. Casamata is probably going to talk about a little bit more. You can, of course, volunteer with local governments, nonprofit agencies, and so forth. And as I mentioned earlier, we have quite an extensive list of different groups that you can volunteer with and links to their websites. Um, finally, I just want to um, reiterate what Dr. Bielmeyer Fraser said and uh, mention all the people. I'm not going to mention all of them, but this is a list of all the people that have really helped out a lot with the St. John's River Report in the last few years, including especially Nikki Spadaro, who's one of our editors, who's done quite a lot of good work on this in the last few years. And so with that, I'll say a couple of additional things, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Bielmeyer Fraser. Um, one thing that I didn't have a PowerPoint slide for was um, the uh, some of the information that's new in the background section of the report, an additional chapter of the report. And one of the things we've included in there this year is an interactive uh, timeline of the history of the St. John's River and also an updated map on land use and land cover. So the background, um, the background chapter of the report has really been updated quite extensively this year. So I would encourage you especially to take a look at the interactive timeline. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and transition and start talking about water quality in the St. John's River. Uh, dissolved oxygen uh, is shown here, and the status of dissolved oxygen or the amount of oxygen that, that's soluble in the, in the water at a certain temperature and at a certain altitude, it's very, very important to support aquatic life. Um, but the dissolved oxygen uh, status in the main stem, in both the freshwater and the marine estuarine portions of the main stem, was satisfactory. 
So these two graphs show the dissolved oxygen mean and standard deviation. And the fresh water is the graph on the left and the marine estuarine portion would be the graph on the right um, of the lower St. John's River main stem. The, the solid and dotted, dotted lines show the water quality criteria. So values above this line are satisfactory and meet the criteria. So you can see that the mean values are in fact above the water quality criteria, which means that they would be suitable to support aquatic life and within acceptable um, ranges. However, where we do see some problems is in the tributaries. Again, dissolved oxygen is shown here. We have the graph on the left is, is representing the data as a box and whisker plot. So the, the box, the green box is the median and about the middle 50% of the data. The whiskers or the blue lines on either side of the box are the maximum and the minimum values of dissolved oxygen. Uh, for 2021, well, really for the entire time range that's shown there, you can see that there are quite a few minimum values that are actually going well below the water quality criteria. So that's where we run into problems. So because of this, because we have so many minimum values that are uh, these low DO events, um, the status of the DO in the tributaries is unsatisfactory. And this has been problematic for quite some time. Now, the other issue with low DO events is that not only does it stress out the biota, but you also have a increased liberation of phosphorus. So more phosphorus is actually available and enters into the water. So that's quite concerning as well. The two main nutrients of concern in the St. John's River are nitrogen and phosphorus. So first I'll discuss nitrogen. Uh, the total nitrogen in the lower St. John's River is shown in the graph on the left, and the total nitrogen in the tributaries of the St. John's River is shown on the right. Now for both of these, um, for nitrogen in general in, the, in both the main stem and the tributaries, uh, we have a status of satisfactory. So a little bit of good news. Um, if you see the dotted line, that again is the, that's the numeric standard peninsular uh, Florida value of 1.54 milligrams of total nitrogen per liter. Now that's not the water quality criteria because the water quality uh, criteria is based on a total maximum daily, daily load of nitrogen, not the amount of nitrogen that's actually in the water. So the reference value that we used in the report was the numeric standard. But if you compare the values that are in these graphs to the numeric standard, you can see that quite the nitro, most of the nitrogen data are actually in 2021 below the, the standard. So that means that they're within acceptable limits. So the status again is satisfactory. And these graphs just show the trends over the past five years in the main stem and the tributaries. And in the tributaries in particular, we're actually seeing a downward trend. So that means the nitrogen is actually improving. So the trend for nitrogen in the tributaries is actually improving. So a little bit of good data in this year's report in that the nitrogen is within acceptable limits and it's actually improving in the tributaries, which is where we see uh, you know, a lot of the problems. Now, contrary to that, we have the phosphorus data, status and trends. Uh, if you look at these two graphs that are presented, this, they show total phosphorus in the lower St. John's River in the graph to the left and total phosphorus in solely the tributaries in the graph to the right. Um, so the phosphorus values are actually, uh, many of the phosphorus values, particularly in the tributaries, are actually well above the um, the numeric standard, which is 0.12 milligram total phosphorus per liter. Now the graph to the left shows the entire uh, lower St. John's River Basin values. So that includes the main stem and the tributaries. But if we just talk about the main stem, most of the values are actually below the numeric standard. So the status of phosphorus in the main stem is satisfactory. The status of total phosphorus in the tributaries is unsatisfactory. And again, that's where we have you know, most of our issues is in the actual, the, in the tributaries. And these values show, or these uh, graphs show the trends of total phosphorus in the main stem. So the, the total phosphorus in the main stem is trending upwards, and that's uh, the graph on the left. The total phosphorus in the tributaries is unchanged as far as the, the trends go. 
Now, it's important to keep in mind that for all of these values, um, you, you do see pockets or you see locations where you the, the status may be acceptable, acceptable, but or satisfactory. But you you do have um, certain times of the year, certain locations where you can have spikes in these nutrients and contaminants and other parameters. So that is a, a caveat. So as a consequence of high nutrients in the water body and low dissolved oxygen, uh, we can have algal blooms. And my, my colleague, Dr. Dale Casamata, will talk more about algal blooms next. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, the algae are always kind of an interesting uh, group of creatures. Um, we talk about them as bloom formers, but at their basis, they're the, uh, the basis of all aquatic life. Uh, they are the things that everything has to eat, and a healthy ecosystem should have a lot of fantastic algae. But the reason we really care about them is when they get out of control, and we see that they have uh, very visible effects on their environments. And that's what we're finding more and more in Florida, that we're having a, a proliferation of algal blooms. And so that's where we really try to focus our research and our efforts is understanding what's causing these blooms and if it's increasing or decreasing, if there's anything we human beings can really do about that. So why do we care so much about all this algae? Well, one of the big things we note about the algal blooms is they have an outsized impact on our ecosystems. Uh, algal blooms are very uh, significant uh, from everything from aesthetics. No one wants to see their ponds completely covered with green things. Um, but even more significantly, they decrease oxygen levels. Even though these organisms are photosynthetic at night and when they are, their corpses start to decay, uh, the oxygen gets removed from these systems and that can cause terrible fish kills. They're also very significant for light uh, occlusion because as more of these organisms start to bloom, we get much less light touching the submerged aquatic vegetation. And this is exactly what we're finding with the manatee issues, for example, that the manatees just don't have enough food because of these uh, algal blooms. There's also always the problem with mechanical issues as well. Uh, boating or rafting through algal mats is incredibly tedious and very, very difficult and can be very, very uh, destructive for equipment. And then finally, most significantly perhaps, is the uh, potentiality of toxin production. We're finding more and more that these algal blooms are, are uh, being uh, uh, really driven by a group of organisms that can, under certain circumstances, produce a wide variety of toxins. So that's why we care so much about keeping track of these sorts of things so we can know and we can mitigate the worst impacts of these organisms. Now, how do we actually measure algae? Algae by themselves are kind of difficult to articulate because there's a lot of heterogeneity into when they appear and how often they appear. So one great marker we can use is chlorophyll A, which is just a common photosynthetic pigment that land plants produce as well. Chlorophyll A is kind of a nice surrogate for algal growth because it's a thing you can modify or you could uh, check very easily. Downside about chlorophyll A is exactly as I said before, is this heterogeneity in time of day. Many algal mats will float up to the surface during the daylight to photosynthesize and then submerge themselves at night. So there are always a couple of caveats with using chlorophyll data. One is that there's this diurnal aspect of that. That's always quite significant. And two, you can actually have a tremendous algal bloom, lots of standing algae, but if it gets grazed quickly by a little zooplankton or fish, for example, you're just not gonna see it. So chlorophyll is fantastic for us to use, but there are those caveats. So what does the actual data say about the state of the river? Well, remember that the uh, St. John's River is a relatively long river, and as it flows out from its headlands all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean, we note that there are different amounts of chlorophyll depending on where we start to sample. This is also pretty significant because while algal blooms are typically a freshwater kind of phenomenon, there are obviously red tides as well that occur in the marine habitats. So looking at chlorophyll levels, we have to examine the total uh, community along these sorts of gradients. So what do we see when we look at the data? When we look at the data, we see that the average chlorophyll values along the run of the St. John's River are actually not that particularly high. Um, and this is fantastic because this means that the ecosystems are not going to be impinged that much about these major algal outbreaks. Now that noted, 
There is a lot of heterogeneity to this. And why would there be this heterogeneity in these algal blooms? Well, there are many stochastic effects that are going to greatly impact how algal blooms are going to be presented. Different amounts of rainfall, for example. A lot of rain can wash nutrients into the surrounding bodies of water. And after a couple of days, the algae can start to respond and we see tremendous blooms. On the other hand, a prolonged period of rain can actually be great for systems because it could flush the extra particulate matter, extra nutrients and such out of these systems, starving the algae of the needed nitrogen and phosphorus they need for proliferation. When we look at the data, though, from the St. John's River, we actually see that our levels are not that far from what the EPA guidelines would estimate would be considered a mesotrophic kinds of system. And this is a pretty healthy kind of system, keeping in mind also that Florida already has some nutrient rich environments anyways. So it's kind of impressive in that regard that we're not seeing more algal blooms than we do on an everyday basis now. All of that noted, if you've been paying any attention to the news this year, you've noticed a vast proliferation of these kinds of news stories, where we see everything from mass uh, dolphin fatalities to manatees uh, being destroyed uh, to uh, fisheries being impacted and such. And that is because while we're not seeing as many algal blooms in the heart of the St. John's River, per se, we are seeing extensive blooms throughout the state of Florida. And these are the things that we care a lot about. Not only is this going to infect, uh, affect the native organisms that use these bodies of water and such, it's going to affect everything from the fisheries communities uh, to potable drinking water and such. So that's why we have to monitor these things and keep them under great uh, scrutiny. What we are finding, though, is that we're finding increases in what we refer to as harmful algal blooms. And these are mostly compri uh, comprised of a group of organisms known as cyanobacteria. Cyanobacterial algal blooms are very difficult for us to get a handle on and control, mainly because cyanobacteria are unique in that they can fix atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, there are two limiting nutrients that almost all algae respond to, nitrogen and phosphorus. Cyanobacteria, since they are actual bacteria, can actually produce their own nitrogen from gases in the atmosphere. So it is very difficult to control these. Cyanobacteria are also incredibly deleterious because they are the kings of toxin production. Um, they produce uh, neurotoxins and, and uh, hepatotoxins. They have been responsible for bald eagle die-offs, for manatee die-offs, for dolphin die-offs, um, and a variety of other kinds of organisms. So this is where we really have to start to um, uh, try to get a handle on why are these algal blooms increasing so much? Can we actually do something to mitigate the worst impacts of these kinds of systems? So how does this kind of play out in the future? Are these things going to get better or are they going to get worse? Well, all signs indicate that while we're having some great success mitigating the worst aspects of these algal blooms, we're stopping point, pour, uh, point source pollution, for example, we are going to face more and more blooms going forward. Why is that? Well, one of the big factors that influences how many algal blooms we get are things like human development. As we human beings develop more and more habitats, especially around bodies of water, we find that increased nutrients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, make their ways into these bodies of water. We find increasing siltation, for example, uh, more inclusion, and we're actually finding we're having problems with invasive taxa, for example. So while all of those things aren't necessarily in the heart of the St. John's River, many of our surrounding tributaries and bodies of water are experiencing these harmful algal blooms right now. So this is definitely something we have to keep our eyes out for and try to find a way of monitoring these in real time so that we can let folks know exactly what's happening. And so with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Penwell. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to kind of continue Sorry about that. I'm going to continue the microbiology trend and kind of switch over to talk about um, bacteria that we find in the St. John's River. So the question is, is why do we care about the water quality in terms of the microorganisms that we find in the St. John River? Well, one of the reasons that we do care about this is because when we come in contact with harmful bacteria, we can be exposed to pathogenic microorganisms that can lead to, to diseases. Um, as we pointed out throughout the, the panel discussion here that we do like to use the St. John River as well as tributaries as part of our recreation, whether it's fishing or swimming. So coming into contact with some of these pathogenic microorganisms can lead to diseases like gastrointestinal illnesses, respiratory, ear infection, eye infections, as well as skin related illnesses, ranging anywhere from rashes to um, 
necrotizing fasciitis. In the United States, approximately about there's a 90 million cases per year that are related to recreational water illnesses, which equates to about $2.9 billion in terms of healthcare burdens. So the question is, where do these sources of pollutions come from and that could expose us to these pathogenic microorganisms? Well, part of that comes from is fecal bacteria. So where are fecal bacteria coming from? Um, or excuse me, the source is going to be fecal pollution. Where are these coming from? Well, this is coming from sewage, um, sanitation overflow, wastewater, runoff from agricultural areas that have cattle. The question, you know, one of the concerns is that we really shouldn't be seeing many microorganisms coming from sewage since the Clean Water Act in 1977 requires all sewage to be disinfected before it's released back into the environment. And they're supposed to be monitoring for a specific number of microorganisms before it is released. However, we do know that there are issues that arise anywhere from sewage pipes breaking, septic tanks linking, as well as just general overflow. So with all that coming, we do see a wide range of pathogenic microorganisms that we can find in water bodies. And I do have in this table uh, some examples of these waterborne pathogens that can lead to illnesses that were on the previous page. And you can see I've broken them up into bacteria, viruses, and parasites. And just to point out a few that are very familiar with uh, everyone, salmonella, generally what we do see with um, illnesses that are going to be related to diarrhea, as well as certain subspecies uh, of E. coli, viruses like enterovirus and norovirus, and then we do have parasites like Gerardia that is going to be uh, is a well-known parasite for causing diarrheal illnesses. Now, we do want to detect uh, our microorganism population to ensure that it is going to be safe for uh, recreational users. But the, one of the difficult things is it's very hard to look at individual microorganisms to kind of detect if they are present in the water system. So how do we get around that? Well, we're going to use uh, a monitoring programs to look at you know, the general quality of the water. And in this case, what we are going to use is we're going to use fecal indicator bacteria, or FIB. Now, these are going to be surrogate microorganisms that we're going to use to basically assess for that, right? Um, these FIB are going to be uh, a way that we can look at water quality and kind of have indirect evidence of what the risk is to human health. In the past, it used to be our uh, fecal coliform bacteria. Um, since 2012, with the uh, recreational water quality criteria that have changed that the FDP has uh, adopted, we now are going to use enterococci and E. coli as our FIB. We are going to use enterococci more for our marine uh, indicators, so those tributaries that are uh, have a high salinity that we consider marine, and then E. coli is going to be used for our freshwater. The reason why there was a switch to um, E. coli and enterococci versus using just fecal coliform is two reasons. Number one is that E. coli and enterococci are better predictors of GI illnesses than just using total fecal, uh, excuse me, total fecal coliform. And then also the FIBs of uh, using enterococci and E. coli. One of the main reasons for using these is that you're going to find them solely in the intestines of warm-blooded animals. So when we're assessing for the water quality using these FIBs, there are numbers that we are looking for. And I have them listed on the table here. And you can see that they are different for um, E. coli, which will be used for our fresh water, and enterococci, which is going to be using our FIB for uh, marine environments. Now you can see why I have, I have geographic mean or geometric mean and STV, which SD, STV stands for statistical, statistical threshold value. I'm going to focus on the STV values just because that is what is generally used by the FDP. So what we're looking at here is we are going to take a, a sample of water from tributaries in the main stem and we are going to plate it on specific media that is going to allow for the growth of these FIB bacteria and try to inhibit the growth of the others. And what we're going to look for is we're going to look for a number of how many colonies are forming out of 100 mils. So anything over 130 colonies for over 400 mils for the enterococca is going to be considered above exceedance for our FIB indicator. For E. coli, it's a little higher. It's 410 colonies per 100 mils. Anything above that is going to be considered above our exceedance. Now, when we talk about STV and looking at a water body, uh, whether it's a tributary in the main stem, 
we're going to, you know, individuals are going to be collecting water. They're going to be doing this plating method. And what we are trying to get is not have 10% of all the samples above that exceedance of the numbers that you find there for Enterococci and E. coli. So what is the water quality status of the main stem as well as the tributaries? Well, one thing is we could say is that the water quality of the main stem is satisfactory with the, with the trend unchanging. However, that is not true for the tributaries. The tributaries, as has been pointed out throughout this panel, seems to be a big concern of different contaminants that are affecting water quality. Um, when we look at it, the general status of it is it is unsatisfactory with the chain, uh, excuse me, with the trend being unchanged from previous reports. In summary, you could see that there are 56 impaired water bodies for fecal indicator bacteria. 27 of those 56 are on the FDEP verified list of being um, unsatisfactory, as well as some of those being on the EPE verified list for water quality issues. Um, seven of the tributaries have exceedances over 100%, meaning that every sample that has been collected and tested is above the numbers that were on the previous slide. Only 10 of the tributaries that have been tested that are of that 56 or have exceedances under 50%. The lowest one, was at exceedance rate of 21%. So 21% of all samples tested were ab or, or above that exceedance level. And that was the Ortega River, which is testing for E. coli, which is our fresh water indicator. Of those 56 impaired water bodies, 29 of them have basin management uh, action plans, which is being used to help restore water quality of these tributaries. Unfortunately, when we look at what's going on in those 29 that have the BMAPs associated with them, no tributaries have reached compliance quite yet. We do see some that are improving. Um, with the lowest exceedance is 22%, which is the uh, Big Fish Weir Creek, which is looking at uh, enterococci since it is a marine body. And then we do have some that are over 100% with two of them with Blockhouse and Miller Creek looking at the E. coli exceedance since they're fresh water. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we can take away from this is that we do have our tributaries are generally very unsatisfactory. So the question becomes why? Well, one of the things that the FDEP does as well as other scientists would like to do is try to figure out where the contamination is coming from. And that's where we're going to kind of turn to source tracking tools. So there has been a lot of effort put forth to determine the source. Where is it coming from? Is it animal? Is it human? And with that, we are going to try to use a bunch of different source tracking tools that are ranging from both chemical tracers and genetic signatures. So to look for if it's human associated, one of the things they are going to do is they are going to do different tests to see if a human associated bacteria, bacteroides that's generally found in the gut of humans is present in those water samples. We're also going to use chemical tracers like sucralose, which is an artificial sweetener, which is not broken down in the intestines, as well as ibuprofen and acetaminophen, which is not, excuse me, fully digested in the GI tract and can be found in these water sources. The reason why we're doing these source tracking uh, or using these source tracking tools is, number one, we can determine if the source of contamination is human or not. Is it coming from a human? Therefore, it could be other issues in terms of septic tank or um, sanitation overflow, or is it coming from an animal source? Um, source tracking tools allow us also to determine if it's recent or not. So is this a recent problem or is this something that used to be a human, but that has kind of closed itself, but the bacteria have taken hold there and have set up uh, and uh, kind of use this as an environmental niche. And the other thing we can determine from this is the source of contamination treated or untreated human waste. I do want to show a previous map that was used, um, or excuse me, that was um, created in 2018 by the FDP, doing just that, using these source tracking tools to determine if the contaminant source was human um, treated waste, or excuse me, human waste or um, untreated waste, excuse me, if it was human treated waste untreated waste, or if it was animal runoff in terms of rumen runoff, you can see the red solid dots is where we are going to have the known untreated human waste, where we have the animal runoff is going to be the red triangles, and then where we kind of suspect that there might be untreated human waste is going to be the open circles that are outlined in red. And you can see here looking at different tributaries where source tracking tools are being used, you can see that we have a lot of dots here that are showing that we do have areas where these FIB increases are linked where we know we have known untreated human waste that are entering these water bodies. 
one of the things that um, the FDP as well as Jacksonville is uh, doing is having a septic tank phase out. And why is that? We do know that there is a correspondence with septic tanks and septic tanks that are old and maybe non-functional, meaning that they are linking and having higher correspondence of FIB in that particular water body. In fact, when we look through, and, and this is a partnership that is being done with the city of Jacksonville as well as JEA, when they estimate it, they've, we realize there's over 24,000 septic tanks that need to be phased out due to they are either failing or have failed or they're getting up there in age where they come, could have a chance of failing. Um, this is about a $2.5 billion project, so it is a little bit of a pricier project. And you can see that um, 2016, um, C, uh, City of Jacksonville, as well as, well as JEA, um, raised about $45 million that was alloca uh, allocated for uh, to replace about 1,600 septic tanks. In 2021, another $100 million was approved to put for this project. And right now, you could see that um, coming, uh, excuse me, the latest update from September of 2020 or 2022 is that the septic tank phase out has been focused on three uh, neighborhoods. That's the Biltmore, Beverly Hills, and Crystal Bell neighborhoods. As we speak, the Biltmore neighborhood is the closest one to being completed. About 95% of septic tanks have been replaced and they have been onto the city sewage. Beverly Hills, the east side of the neighborhood is about 50% complete with the west side just starting. And then the Crystal Bell, uh, Crystal Bell, uh, Crystal Bell, excuse me, um, neighborhoods will be moving to the septic tank phase out here shortly. Um, they've also, um, the city of Jacksonville is also now trying to raise or allocate funding for the Riverview areas to get septic tank phase out. So one of the things I want to end out, I want to end the uh, my presentation with is kind of looking at if there is a correspondence or correlation between FIB and septic tank. So um, using some GIS data that was provided by um, Ashley Johnson, what you could see in this map here is you see these red dots and these red dots correspond to where you have septic tanks in the Arlington area. The orange shaded regions is the tributary that is located within that area. And we are focusing on Newcastle Creek, the Red Bay Branch, the Strawberry Creek tributaries, the Silver Smith Creek uh, tributary, Jones Creek, as well as the Cowhead Creek. And what I could say right now is you could see the tributaries that are kind of near the Silverleaf and the uh, excuse me, Silver Smith Creek and the Strawberry Creek. You could see the abundance there as well as the Red Bay. Um, branch tributary. So one with the FIB, if you look through the river report at the FIB section, the Red Bay branch tributary has over 100% exceedance, as well as the Silver Sea uh, uh, Creek has over 100% uh, exceedance. In fact, the other ones themselves have all over 50% exceedance, showing you that they do have a lot of, hef, uh, uh, excuse me, high FIB. So a lot of these uh, indicator bacteria present, and there could be this great correspondence between the number of septic tanks as well as the FIB present in that area. And we do know that microorganisms do affect all aspects of life, including the aquatic life, which we are going to hear about from Dr. Pinto. Thank you, uh, Dr. Penwell. So uh, I would like to get into talking to you about aquatic life. And here we go. Give me a minute. Um, here we go. Okay, so I'd like to start off with this slide. And it sort of gives you an idea of some of the indicators and the status and trends in this section. So first of all, aquatic uh, vegetation, submerged aquatic vegetation considered unsatisfactory and uncertain. Uh, wetlands unsatisfactory and worsening. This hasn't changed since last year. Uh, or for the last few years, I will add, uh, since we had Hurricane Irma in 17. Um, microinvertebrates, there's not much data, so that remains uncertain and, uh, and, and the trend is uncertain as well. Uh, threatened species, endangered species, uh, are wood storks, bald eagles, and manatees seem to be doing better, their satisfactory status, and continuing to improve. And then um, non-native uh, species, of course, gets worse, it seems, every year. But this year is no different from last year. So our total is at uh, about 92 species. 
Um, and let me get into a little bit more detail as we go forward here. So first of all, I'll talk about submerged aquatic vegetation. And we have a number of species in the river. There's probably around 12 to 14 species that we see. Um, very significant habitat uh, forms very important nursery grounds for our uh, fisheries and aquatic species. Our birds, manatees is, is a, a tremendous area for food. Uh, and of course, is helps to improve water quality and to control uh, erosion to some extent. Unfortunately, they're very sensitive. And so changes in salinity, particularly the saltier the water, these are freshwater plants, they don't like the salt so much. So if the salt kicks up for any period of time, like it did in the early 2017, uh, during a drought there, that, that will stress out these, these, these plants and they'll start to die back. Uh, things like water quality that uh, Dr. Casamata uh, mentioned earlier, uh, water clarity, uh, the algae in the water or color in the water tends to attenuate light. So that will, of course, uh, cause these plants to die back as well. Um, shoreline condition is important depending on how much energy there is in the shoreline. You know, if there's a lot of wave action, it's going to be harder for these plants to take hold. And then, of course, during the droughts, when the water tends to clear up, you tend to get things growing on the plants themselves. We call those things epiphytes, and they tend to attenuate growth in, in some ways. Recently, uh, we've been finding out some more information. Uh, Dan Colterman with the FWC uh, Aquatic Resources Ecosystem uh, Restoration um, Office has been working with what he calls exclusion plots. So by building some of these plots and fencing off areas, he's been able to get the SAV, the submerged aquatic vegetation, to grow back uh, very well. And so one thing we didn't know so much about is how much pressure uh, predation is on these grass beds. So since they've been knocked back pretty badly since uh, the hurricane in 2017, uh, they're having trouble regenerating, worse than in past years. And this predation pressure is not helping. So it seems like the seed bank for these uh, grasses has been uh, severely impacted. So these exclusion plots are actually a, a something that looks like uh, a method that might be used to try to uh, fortify that seed bank going forward. In the right-hand column here, you see a number of uh, sampling sites that we used to have a lot of sampling sites. They went away. It, we didn't have as many over the years, and now they're coming back. So that's a good sign uh, in terms of research on the submerged aqu aquatic vegetation. <clears throat> I'm going to show you some graphs here about different areas of the river. So in this picture, you can see on the left here, this is, this is going from the Fuller Warren Bridge all the way down to Hallows Cove. So the top two graphs on the right refer to the area that's above the, the Buckman Bridge, so the, the top half of this picture. Um, and generally, if you look at that, you can see the sort of the boom and the bust cycle of these grasses over time. And uh, right now, on the very far right, you can see we're in a bust cycle and the grass beds, uh, the green line and the blue line are talking about the length of those grass beds perpendicular to the shore, uh, how, how, how far they stretch out from the shore and how much grass there's there. And then the the uh, yellow line bef below them is talking about how dense those grasses are. So you can see they're pretty much declined and we're waiting for them to recover. This recovery is worse in the northern section because we have salt and many of the plants are sort of stressed anyway. As we move south of the Buckman Bridge, that boom and bust cycle is not as severe and it looks like the plants are doing fairly well in that, in that area and are recovering well. And this is a picture of, in the northern section, how much of those grasses are represented by Vallisneria tape grass, or the manatee grass that you might have heard it called in the past. And you can see that the amount of tape grass is very, very much uh, decimated since 2017. This is the area south of the Buckman Bridge, took a hit after 2017 Irma, and then has bounced back a little bit. So if we continue that, this, this uh, further south, um, you can see here, this is the area from uh, Hallows Cove down to about uh, Federal Point. 
And again, if you look at the left-hand side of these graphs compared to the right-hand side of these graphs, you can see there's a general downward trend over time. So the grasses have been declining in this area. Um, the bottom graph there on the right just shows you that the proportion of Vallisneria that, that makes up these grasses has increased a little bit again, uh, which looks like a sort of recovery there. And here we go. Sorry about that. This slide's taking a few minutes to um, update. So now this is the area from Federal Point down towards Lake George. So in the middle there is Palatka. So from Federal Point to Palatka, again, look at the left-hand side of the graphs and look at the dots on the right-hand side of the graphs, and you'll see that there's a serious decline in grass bed length and density. Um, south of Palatka, again, same sort of picture. Grass beds are in bad shape and uh, we hope that they are going to start to recover soon. This is just showing you the Vallison area. The proportion of those grasses, even though they're declined in length, uh, are mostly Vallison area in this area. And again here, south of uh, Palatka, mostly Vallison area. And then the next couple of graphs I'm going to show you here, and I'm sh this will be the last of these graphs. Uh, are for, on the left is Crescent Lake over time, various parameters. And Crescent Lake is, is highly variable and very much uh, impacted by the color of the water. Um, and so there's virtually no grass in, in, in Crescent Lake, Lake right now, unfortunately. And then on the right, the three, gra the three graphs on the right represent Lake George, and there's only two sampling times there. 2020, the middle, there wasn't any sampling done. But again, if you look at the dots on the left compared to the dots on the right, there's a da general downward trend in these grasses. And if we look at how many of those transects over the years are bare, you'll see that, incre that percentage increasing over time since 2015. So again, showing decline in the grass beds. I'm hoping that this uh, decline will not continue and will start to look better uh, going forward. But again, this, this idea of, of predation on already impacted uh, grasses is, uh, is, is, is significant. I'd like to switch on to wetlands here as well. Wetlands are uh, extremely important, particularly from this point of view of resiliency. Resiliency to flooding, most of all. Um, but apart from that, they provide food and, and habitat for all our wildlife species. Um, and they're so very, very important. And they also are stressed by pollution, sea level rise, changes in water levels, invasive species, and habitat fragmentation. For the most part, these wetlands are um, permitted in, in, in acreages less than 10 acres. And so these small, small little cuts to the environment is like death by a thousand cuts. And increasingly, what this graph shows you here, the blue bars are how those things are being permitted by mitigation banking. And so the other bars in this graph represent more beneficial ways of dealing with wetlands, like conserving them, enhancing them, uh, uh, preserving them, you know, making new wetlands. Um, what we're doing with this mitigation banking and these blue bars here, which seem to have suddenly jumped up a little bit with the, with the development boom that's going on in about 2015 and after that, um, is swapping wetlands from where they are providing very important ecosystem services. These things like preventing, give, giving us resiliency to flooding to rural areas where that's not, a, not, not really gonna be much help. And here's a picture that kind of shows you where those mitigation banks are. They're sort of very far removed from the coast or from those shorelines where we could be losing these things, where those ecosystem services are very much needed. The value of those ecosystem services is more than double per year what that nominal value of, of, of that land is probably from a real estate per, uh, point of view. 
Uh, and this slide just sort of reiterates the summary of what I just said about wetlands. So I'm not going to dwell on it too long, but wetlands are unsatisfactory and worsening the way we're, we need to conserve those things. Uh, this slide shows you non-native species and how they've increased over time. Uh, this unfortunately is likely to get worse because as the climate changes, as, we, as things warm up, we're gonna see more of these species moving up from South Florida. We are a major port. We have more than 2000 vessel calls a year. Uh, much of that uh, shipping moves through the Suez Canal and the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is one of the worst places for uh, uh, non-native species. So that's likely to get worse. <clears throat> and as was alluded to earlier, our uh, threatened or endangered species uh, have, have been doing better. You can see that there are graphs there for the bald eagle and the wood stork took a major hit in, in 2017. And basically these storms kind of damage their nests and their, their ability to breed and, and, and shelter. So uh, that's what those dips are. And then now they look like they're increasing again. And here's a a picture of, uh, or, or some numbers about manatee numbers. You can see that in the past, we used to see quite a few manatee numbers on a survey uh, that dipped down uh, significantly after 2017. Um, incidentally, these, the, these storms, Irma physically ripped out a lot of grasses and, and wrecked the habitat quite badly. So uh, there wasn't much food around for manatees to stay around. And then in 2019, moving forward, those numbers are starting to come back. But then you see in uh, 2020, this massive die-off of more than 10% of the manatee population in, in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, and that leads to, you know, less numbers coming up here now. So this year we have back in the 70s uh, on a survey. So that's a good sign. So those, those numbers are coming back. This, this picture just shows you where I saw the manatees uh, earlier in the year to the, uh, in June. And they're all clustered around the area south of the Buckman Bridge where the water gets fresher. Uh, this is the grocery store or the, or, the, or the grocery store for the manatees where they like to chow down and live there and, and, and eat the grasses there. Uh, this is later in the summer. You can see they're starting to spread out and migrate back south through the port down the intercoastal waterway to South Florida before it gets cold. And... Um, before I pass the baton back to um, my colleague here in a minute, the salinity continues to increase long term. But if you look at what's happened most recently, which is quite interesting, this is a graph of what's happened since the hurricane in 2017. Salinity has gone down and conditions in the river are very, very much more fresher. Uh, we've had a lot wetter a uh, few years more recently. Um, and so some of the impacts of increasing salinity tend to be uh, or will be felt mostly in the habitat of the submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, and so that's important because that habitat also provides shelter for many of our fisheries. Uh, the blue crab fishery is one of the main fisheries in the river. Uh, it seems to be doing well. Most of our fisheries resources are doing well, uh, as uh, Dr. Klossman mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, with that, I think I will pass it on to Dr. Bill Meyer again. Okay, I'm going to shift gears and talk about uh, contaminants in the river. The main contaminants that were evaluated in this year's report, or the main groups of contaminants, include metals, polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, and pesticides. So I'm going to start off with metals. Uh, in general, metals in the freshwater portion of the main stem were within acceptable limits, and so the, stat the status uh, was satisfactory. That is with the exclusion of silver. Silver had a, an, an unsatisfactory status, and so the, the concentrations that were found were actually above the acceptable limits. Now, the uh, Contrary to these to these findings, the metals in the saltwater main stem and the metals in the tributaries, again, a little bit more problematic. 
Uh, the metals in the saltwater main stem, including copper, cadmium, lead, nickel, silver, these were actually unsatisfactory. Uh, aluminum, arsenic, and zinc were had satisfactory status, uh, but quite a few more in the of the metals in the saltwater portion of the main stem were were exceeding the acceptable limits and therefore could be problematic and concerning for the aquatic biota. Metals in the tributary, all unsatisfactory. And again, it's just, it this recurring theme of um, uh, an array of different problems that are resulting in the tributaries. These graphs are of um, cadmium and copper concentrations in the saltwater portion of the main stem. So the, the two top graphs are box and whisker plots. The two bottom graphs are mean and standard deviation. But really what I, I want to draw your attention to is within the past, say, five, six years, we're seeing an upward trend of, of these uh, metals in the saltwater portion of the main stem. And that, that trend is consistent for, uh, for a variety of different metals. Okay, so these graphs show the release of metals and the distribution of releases to land, air, and water. And this was in 2019. It was from 54 different TRI facilities over time. And in general, since 2010, uh, really we've had a decrease in the amount of metals that are being actively released um, by these specific TRI, um, TRI facilities. Uh, the Predominant sources of contaminants that are released on the land include vanadium and nickel compounds. The majority of the compounds released to the water include nitrate and sulfuric acid, ammonia, and butyl alcohol comprise the majority of the contaminants that are released to the air. But in general, over the past you know, several years, uh, it's either been stable or we've had a, a reduction of the release of the metals um, from these facilities. Uh, however, we do find that uh, metals from non-point sources, so that are carried in stormwater, that run off from agricultural fields, golf courses, uh, urban developments, uh, that is still increasing. Uh, metals, when they're in the water, they enter the water body and they eventually settle into the sediment. So we also track the metal concentrations in the sediment. And these are generally pretty uh, pretty stable. They can increase if there's more input into the, into the water, but they're not going to be removed generally uh, unless that was an active process. Um, so what we find in metals and the metals and sediments um, all across the board are unsatisfactory. Um, and this is from years and years and years of metal pollution entering to the aquatic system. The, the graph that's shown here is, is um, particularly of mercury. So mercury is a problematic metal in that it bioaccumulates and biomagnifies up the food chain. Um, so the, the highest uh, organisms on the food chain, which in, do include humans, are gonna, going to accumulate the highest concentrations of mercury. And we do have mercury um, still exceeding acceptable thresholds. The, the dotted and the solid, solid lines do show the, the threshold um, effect levels and the threshold uh, effect concentrations. And so those are still exceeded and could cause uh, problems. Also something to keep in mind, when you do have metals in the sediment, anytime you have dis disruption or disturbance of the sediment, it can liberate those metals back into the water column. And then anything residing in the water column can be increased to spiked concentrations. Okay, PCBs are polychlorinated biphenyls. These tend to partition in the sediment, so they're not going to remain for a long time in the water column. And what we did find is that the, um, the mean concentrations of individual PCB congeners, which are shown, and also the total of all uh, PCB congeners, um, the total actually exceeds acceptable limits. And again, the, this, uh, we do have a lack of data, so I was unable to um, determine a trend. But as I said before, the PCBs are there. They're not going anywhere. So uh, I imagine that um, the PCB concentrations are still concerning. But this data, this is the last data that I have, and it was from 2017. So I don't have any recent data um, showing any concentrations. So it could be at this level, and it could be actually increased from this level. 
All right, the next contaminant or class of contaminants is pesticides, but specifically I'm going to start off with organochlorine pesticides. These are the ones that are most problematic. They're going to accumulate and be more pers persistent in the environment and cause more health concerns for uh, an array of different organisms, including humans. Uh, so these graphs show, again, box and whisker uh, plot on the left, and then the mean and standard deviation on the right, but uh, they both show an increase in the OC pesticide concentration in the water column over time. And for this reason, the status was unsatisfactory and this tre trend is unchanged from last year. Uh, organochlorine pesticides, uh, they do tend to partition in the sediment as well, as well as the biota. So uh, we do find that the org organochlorine pesticides in the sediment, uh, these values are also unsatisfactory. Uh, I couldn't uh, determine a trend because I didn't have any data past 2007 for the OC concentration in the sediment. But given the fact that the, the OC pesticide concentration is increasing in the water column, I suspect that it is also increasing in the sediments. Since 2014, there have been a, a variety of other pesticides in addition to organochlorines that have been used for pest control. So this next indicator is total pesticide concentration in the water column. The more recent pesticides are more water soluble, so they will linger and partition in the water column more so than the organochlorine pesticides. And we do see a trend of increasing, um, or increasing total pesticides uh, shown by these, these two graphs. However, if you look on the graph on the right, we do find that in 2020 and 2021, there was a slight decrease in the mean concentrations of total pesticides. Uh, however, given that these are still at elevated levels, the status is unsatisfactory. Okay, so last year I, I wrote a highlight section on PFAS or per and polyfluoro alkyl substances. And I've been trying to get data on PFAS concentrations in the lower St. John's River. Um, unfortunately, they've been unavailable, but the River Alliance just finished a, um, a sampling, a nationwide sampling of PFAS. So I have been told that I can uh, have access to that report. And so in next year's river report, I'll be able to actually include some PFAS data from the St. John's River and give uh, a better idea of how those concentrations um, relate and how, if they're, how concerning they are. In addition to PFAS, uh, there's some other um, there's some other chemicals that have just started to be sampled in the St. Johns River, and these fall under the category of personal care products, including hydrocodone, uh, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, naproxen, sucralose, and caffeine. Uh, I did some preliminary data analysis with this, and I did find that the, there they all of those substances listed have been detected in the St. Johns River in the lower basin. Um, we will actually do a more extensive analysis and uh, report this in next year's report. And um, as Dr. Penwell said, sucralose and acetaminophen and ibuprofen can all be also be used to track uh, these uh, harmful bacteria, so fecal, uh, fecal bacteria. Uh, so the fact that they are actually being detected is indicative not only of the increase in these personal care products that are entering the water bodies, but also um, indicative of increase in the human, um, human-borne uh, fecal bacteria. So with that, I'd like to uh, pass it on to Dr. Brian Zellner, who will talk about some of our educational outreach components. Thank you so much. And before before I dive in, um, I'd like to recognize the the panel and the and the team for uh, uh, all their contributions. Really, a team effort here. Um, I also want to especially acknowledge uh, Dr. Nisa uh, Goldberg from JU and her students. Um, the, this has been material that's that's really um, contributed a lot to the educational outreach. So, what I'm going to share today is uh, the. The features, um, the design features, and then also the highlights of uh, our educational outreach efforts that can be found on the website. 
Um, so key goals that we have for the educational outreach is, is really thinking about scientific li literacy, but also through the uh, lens of the St. John's River, which makes, I, I think, the material here really relevant. Um, and, and thinking of the watershed as a, as a place that we all live um, really brings that connection to uh, students and uh, and the public in general. Um, a key aspect of this is is developing interactive lessons. So these these are going to be lessons that uh, and materials that uh, folks that are working with this um, these materials um, will find a way to connect to it um, and and be active with it. Um, and also a, a key connection with this is is to to try to uh, move some of this material into the secondary schools and the primary schools. Um, so key functions uh, that, that go along with this is scientific literacy. So, so really trying to think of those concepts that sometimes are hard to teach uh, in schools, uh, but really cut across uh, particular topic areas. So thinking of, of collaboration um, and, and, and working with others to interpret data, how those data are represented um, and, and how we interpret that um, becomes really an important thing as we make claims and, and try to understand um, uh, d data and, and the conclusions that we try to draw, and then trying to develop evidence-based recommendations. And I would argue all four of these areas cut across, uh, no matter what content um, that you're working with, whether it's uh, biology, chemistry, physics, uh, but also can connect into um, areas like English and, and math uh, and social studies. Um, so key design components that, that we've really tried to um, incorporate into the materials and the lesson plans is really trying to build in relevance, um, whether it's trying to connect to some sort of charismatic organism um, or thinking about the use, whether it's uh, boating, fishing, swimming, um, even just thinking aesthetically about the river, um, really trying to connect with critical background information on a topic, whether that is... Um, translated or particular data that they might draw from the river report. Um, a, a key component to some of the materials that we've been working with is also uh, trying to do data interpretation. So being able to look at a graph or look at a table um, and not only describe it, but then also to, to describe trends that, that, that they might have and then and draw conclusions based on that data. Uh, another component to it is, is building in assessments. Um, and so trying to have a sense of uh, whether uh, students or the public is understanding uh, what, what you're working with. Uh, and then thinking of those next steps, the idea of, of trying to connect um, action to uh, a greater understanding of, of the river. So looking at uh, some of these components, and these are just some examples that are out there. Um, these are from uh, Dr. Goldberg's uh, JU class. Um, but thinking of some of the background that goes along with it, and again, these are some organisms that students are going to be familiar with, um, may have some interest in, may end up on their uh, dining room table. Um, but these are sort of those entry points that, that students can use in order to start to build interest uh, into some of the more um, esoteric concepts like dissolved oxygen and, and pollutants and things like that. Another component is really uh, trying to build support into uh, helping uh, students interpret and understand um, how data is represented. And so we've got a couple graphs here, and, and it could be that we're trying to interpret the graph, like looking for trends and what's that, what is that based on? But then you look at the right side where it's it's more graph basics. Can they can they tell you what the x-axis is representing, the y-axis is representing, um, and, and starting to understand like why uh, each of those components would be at their uh, requisite axes. Um, and then what I think is really exciting is this idea of citizen science. So the, the, it's not only taking this information and building some sort of connection to it, but it's also taking action. And, and uh, a lot of the materials that we've included uh, on the website uh, provides contact information for um, reporting information or gathering data. Um, but it, it really gives students and the public sort of that next step of, of what they can do um, to uh, be more vested in, in the watershed, uh, but also to take action if um, there's some uh, disturbing trends. Key things when we think about uh, the applications is, is really thinking about those instructional materials. We're, we're continually developing those and adding those to the website. Um, I think one of the key things is, is and I think we've heard a lot of really great information and, and 
great data that, that the team has shared, but how do we take that information and apply it to classrooms? And, and a lot of the work that we've done is trying to take uh, the level that's that's part of the report, but into a level that the that, that kids can understand. Um, developing how to's um, for data interpretation is, is a key aspect of this. Um, and, and also then again, the, those, those resources that allow uh, students to take action and take those next steps. So again, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Dr. Goldberg at, at JU, city of Jacksonville, and then uh, the students in uh, Dr. Goldberg's uh, class. And I will hand it off to the next. All right, I'd like to say thank you to all the panelists and we would be happy to take any questions. We do have questions. Great. Um, some of them regarding dredging. So this will be a multi part. Um, has dredging created more problems, especially when we face a major storm? I'll start on this one. <laughs> uh, in, my, in my opinion and what I've seen in my own research on the river is that we have seen um, spikes in particularly, uh, it, in particular in metal concentrations uh, during the dredging events. And just in my own research, when I, I have a correlation between spikes and metal concentrations that are entering the water column and changes in phytoplankton or algae uh, populations. And uh, also just a decrease in diversity when I do have the high uh, spikes. So there are consequences when when the contaminants are settling into the sediment and they're not disrupted, they're not really, you know, they're not really doing as much damage, but you start moving them around and they go into the water column, especially at very high concentrations, you can see changes in population dynamics. You can see uh, changes in distribution. Uh, some species are going to be more sensitive to whatever contaminant was, uh, was put into the water column and they, they could die off temporarily. Uh, they may or may not come back, but you do see see big changes in the uh, distribution of the aquatic biota. Would anyone else like to contribute? Sure, um, uh, I'll say something about dredging too. I mean, if you if it, there, there's a time aspect to this thing, so if you look at how many years the river has been dredged for, uh, there's this cumulative effect over time, and so as you dig the ditch deeper more salt water is going to push in upstream and that's going to affect, uh, you know, wetlands. It's going to affect the submerged aquatic vegetation, negatively affect those things. Most of our wetlands are actually um, forested wetlands, freshwater forested wetlands. Uh, so they're, they're um, significantly impacted by salt. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, to what degree can septic leaks be addressed by legislation and to what degree can they be detected or monitored? So one of the things and one of the issues about septic tank, um, and I'm going to handle the second part of that question about how they can be monitored, is it's a little bit difficult to monitor individual septic tanks unless you see some sort of evidence like water piling up where you think your septic tank is. And obviously, if you think that it is an issue, it's hard for yourself to go and test it because there's not at home kits that are going to detect for FIB, these fecal indicator bacteria. In terms of legis uh, legislative, uh, legislation, excuse me, is that there is a big push to try to phase out some of these septic takes throughout um, the city of Jacksonville. In fact, if you look at the river report, as well as something that was um, in the news about February, the city of Jacksonville has rank the neighborhoods where they are, would like to start phasing out these septic tanks. And I believe there was about uh, a ranking of 35 and where you see the most concentration of these septic tanks. Okay. I have a very specific question. Um, concerning the data from 27, 2017 vis-a-vis -vis nitrate and phosphate, um, anomal anomalous due to Hurricane Irma are these outliers? So did Irma have an impact on? Um, I'd be happy to answer that. Yes, is, is, is the bottom line. I mean, when you have so many, so much, so many inches of, of rain deposited, that's all going to wash whatever's on the land into the waterways and into the river. 
And so, yes, it, uh, starting 2017 is definitely an anomalous year. It's an anomalous series of years since then, actually. Uh, and so while things sort of come back to the new sort of norm, uh, that's what we're looking at, too. We have to take that into account. Yes. And I have a question kind of along those lines, but you talk about anomalous years. Did our um, the habit change from the pandemic, us being at home and or possibly us being out more, did that possibly impact the quality of the St. John's River? I believe it could have. Uh, I do. I, I've seen uh, in some of my other research, it's not in the St. John's River, but just with great white sharks, I've looked at metal concentrations in white sharks. And um, in 2020 and 2021, I did see actually a decrease in concentration of the metals that were accumulated in white sharks collected from the same site. And I do wonder if there's a, a correlation with just um, less uh, tourism in that area, um, maybe less, you know, uh, you know, as you said, less people out, um, uh, less industry going on, perhaps. But yeah, there could be a correlation. But no, we haven't seen anything with the St. John's River yet. Okay. Um, how does the effect in the health of the tributaries relate to our flood resiliency efforts? Sea level rise, increased temperature, and flooding from storms. Well, um, I would say that one of the, because of the dredging in the river, we have uh, a lot faster movement of water and a lot faster changing conditions. Like, for example, with the tides, the salinity will change a lot quicker. Uh, with the dissolved oxygen, it'll change a lot quicker between high and low tide. Um, with the, the speed of the water will change. It, the channelization that's been been done in the river causes water to move much faster. The problem with that is that it can move up into tributaries much faster when we get a surge of some sort, like from a hurricane or, or uh, increasingly um, a lot more rains and thunderstorms. Uh, so it sort of makes us less resilient in some ways because that water can shoot up into the tributaries and cause flooding particularly like uh, if you think about trout river moncrief creek sort of area some of the areas where these septic tanks are being uh, removed and and people are being hooked up to sewer uh, that's important because uh, water levels will rise as sea levels rise as well the water table will rise and cause more leakage And um, so Eric was wondering about the concern, the impact of coal ash on the river. That's definitely that's definitely an impact. Um, I mean, when we had our recent incident with um, with the coal ash leaking, um, coal ash has a variety of different um, nasty contaminants like arsenic and uh, a variety of lead, a variety of different metals. Um, so yeah, if we have uh, increased coal ash, especially um, that's you know that's being dumped or either intentionally or not intentionally, um, it can actually you know result in more concentrations of these, uh, especially some of the the more toxic contaminants. Yeah, I, I might also add that um, we have a lot of toxins and and dangerous things that pass through our port, uh, but there are safety protocols for that and as long as those safety protocols are being adhered to that protects the river and it protects us in many ways uh, I think the the, the coal ash uh, incident was was a, a number of failures that led to that um, and so it it's something that's important to look at very seriously okay. you talked about um, the contamination from shipping bringing non-native species and other problems. Are there controls in place? Um, someone was reading about bilge filtration, pre-dumping and or dumping offshore. Are these in place and or would they even be effective? I'll have a go at that again. Um, yes, that's a very good point. Uh, there are protocols in place and uh, for a number of years now. And what would be interesting is to look at the before and the after 
the effects of those protocols to see if you know the native spe uh, non-natives went up or down after that, which we have not done. Uh, but I will say the majority of our non-natives are freshwater. And so they do come from uh, releases like people buying pets and things and not knowing what to do with them in the past or getting rid of them just by releasing them into the environment. And so there is a general um, poor understanding of the effects of these things and how they impact our environment. Uh, so a lot more education and outreach would help on that side of things. So the ballast uh, water um, contamination is, has been addressed, I think, for the most part. Um, Mark wanted to know, is, are, the, are there any more grass inclusion zones planned in the near future? We can talk about that. And can the public get involved by helping to plant some of these grasses? Yes, that's a, that's a very exciting bit of research that's ongoing. Um, and so more of that will be happening in the future. In fact, the Water Management District is involved in, in that too. Um, and I, I, um, I'm looking forward to seeing some of that data and some papers coming out on that. Uh, the public can get involved. Uh, Dan Colderman, who's been doing this work, uh, has a huge contingent of people and volunteers that help him to build these fences and, and um, uh, exclusion plots in the river. And uh, he's always looking for more help. So um, most of uh, us are on, if you go to the website, uh, you will see under resource team, our contact information. And if you want to want to get involved, you can get in touch with me and I'll, I'll put you in touch with Dan. Great, I think so. I just want to add something about that. In the um, second to last page of the general public report, there's a series of links to nonprofit agencies, government agencies and universities. And it has a link to the Marine Science Research Center over at JU and also to the Environmental Institute at UNF. And there are people at both of those universities working on things like this, in addition to shoreline restoration and things like that. And also, uh, thank you for that. That's a good point. There's also lots of nonprofits that are involved. I mean, there's Audubon, Sierra Club, uh, St. John's Riverkeeper. Uh, all these organizations also provide volunteer opportunities for people to do good for the river. I think that about covers it. Okay, well, thank you for joining us this afternoon and also join ADAPT on November 3rd at WJCT Studios for a discussion about how these findings impact the community and what's next. Thank you.